Welcome to week three. And this week we're actually going to get into the prohibited acts. And there's two primary prohibited acts that we talk about for the majority when we talk about the FDA or the USDA. And what you'll hear a lot in industry and you'll hear people talk about, especially during an inspection or some event that's occurring, a recall, for example, is is the product adulterated or is the product misbranded? And those are the two primary camps that we'll see prohibited acts fall into. So I wanted to start with adulteration, I think, because it's one that we see a lot in the press, it's one that we see in the media, and it's good to start with that grounding of things that are familiar and then move into the misbranding next week. For, as you can tell from the readings, for the majority we're talking about the FDA, but we will get into in the third component of this week uh, the USDA's adulteration as well and do a little bit of the comparison about what's an adulterant for FDA purposes what we're talking about you know non raw meat products versus uh, these other food items so we're beginning with the FDA and you know what's become clear I think from the top is the impetus for the 1906 act was a lot of problems in the food chain. Food production was just really horrible. And so that did focus on adulteration to a very big degree. And so I, th I think that's why we see such a robust system for adulteration in place. And not only is it robust, it's incredibly complicated. And this uh, flow chart gives you a sense of the thinking process you have to go through when you're answering what seems like a very straightforward question. Is it adulterated? Is the product in some way contaminated with something? And we'll get into how we narrow and, and make that definition clear, how we look at the statutory language. But from the very beginning, I want you to get a sense of how this, this process works and also to give you the caveat that we're not going to get into all of this. We're going to cover the, the main hubs of what this means. We're going to separate out of this food additives and food colorants, and we're going to do that as a separate component. And everything else we're going to leave uh, for hopefully an advanced course. That's something I'm pushing for is to have an advanced law course where we can actually get into the full breadth of this process and, and this definitions. The one that probably is the most familiar is the ones that we will see in the news about um, rodents being in the facility, cockroaches, feces, you know, uh, rat feces, and all these kind of things, uh, what we'd call filth. That's something that's really common. We're not going to cover it in, in this uh, per, uh, portion, but that is something that um, you may have heard in the media or encountered, and, and that is a form of adulteration, but what we're going to focus on is three components, and we'll get into that in this next slide. So here are the, the scope of coverage for our purposes. We're going to look at this May Render Injurious Standard. It's in Section 402A1. And this applies, as we'll see, to what's what we call added components to food. And we'll get into what that means in this lecture. We're going to talk about the Ordinarily Injurious Standard. And that is also in 402A1. And it, it's we, we break this out. We bifurcate these standards. But really, it's one paragraph with a comma, and that comma is enough to give us a breaking point and create two standards really when it's one paragraph in the in the statute. And then what we'll get into, not in this first component, but in the second component for this week, we'll, we'll break it out as its own lecture, is economic adulteration. We'll spend a full 20 minutes talking just on economic adulteration. And the reason I did that is not only is it really interesting to look at it historically, to see modern examples of that, but also to see the shift that's occurring within the agency. The, the very birth of the Food and Drug Act, the Pure Food and Drug Act, was economic adulteration. Then we see this period of time when that becomes a dormant issue. <clears throat> and as we'll see in the lecture, it goes from being a dormant issue now to coming to the forefront again with the Food Safety Modernization Act. So I wanted to give that its own time, and, and we have plenty to talk about when we talk about these other two standards. So here's the evolution of, of this idea of adulteration 
in our food safety system. And it, as I mentioned, it really begins in 1906. And in 1906, the original Pure Food and Drug Act, which was all of five pages, had this standard that said if food was adulterated, if any added substance was poisonous or deleterious. And it, that uh, introduction of that poisonous or deleterious ingredient could be injurious to health. So we kind of have three words there that are of importance. We have poisonous, deleterious, injurious to health. Those kind of make our, or frame our standard there. Poisonous, we can kind of think uh, of a natural definition there. Uh, listeria, E. coli, uh, chemicals. And those sort of areas are gonna be potential poisons. If those are present in the food, they have a, a poisonous reaction. <clears throat> Deleterious is a word at the time. I don't think any of us use this in our daily uh, words, the di daily dialect. <clears throat> deleterious is something that's harmful or injurious. And so that broadens the scope. We're not just looking at chemical contamination, microbiological contamination. We're looking at um, glass fragments, wood fra fragments, metal fragments, anything like that that can be potentially injurious if eaten. And, and I think injuries to health and it is self-explanatory there. So we're talking very broadly on this definition of adulteration. Mm -hmm. The 1938 Act, which really gives us the modern act that we have built on what that meant. It, it finally puts some um, clarity to this very broad definition. What does it mean to be added? What does it mean injuries to health? What about naturally occurring items in food? What, <clears throat> how does that play in it? You know, if there's naturally occurring mercury, as you see in the readings, how does that play into this definition? And so we got 402A1, and we have this, this standard, if it's an added food, if it's an added ingredient to the food where it must, uh, may render it injurious to health. So we have a, a higher, um, standard there if it's added that it makes it easier for the FDA to to enforce and then but in the cases where it's not added then we just have to show that it's ordinarily injurious and so we have a standard for what we'll see is basically naturally occurring items after this process from 1938 this was the standard and it is the standard for now for over 76 years as the reading explains, we've added some amendments that address particular issues. We're gonna do food additives and food coloring in its own, pesticide resi residue, the, the Delaney amendments talking about carcinogens. We've had a number of small amendments that are very focused and a lot of times not enforced for a long time. And we see that with the Delaney amendments and some others in the reading where they're enacted, they're enforced maybe for a short period of time and then it's not really until modern times that we see them relifted out of the, the dust and and reused so it's kind of amazing to think about from 1906 to 1938 to the, our modern day this is the standard for adulteration this is the standard for food safety that really is the the foundation of our safety net and it raises some questions should that be the case do we need an update and and those sort of things so that's pretty interesting. So we have these two standards and th and you may have noticed in the readings I've, I'm mixing in from the readings the section numbers there as well as the updated section numbers. The section numbers in the statutes get shifted around when new laws are added or when amendments come in or not, you know, not even laws that are necessarily affecting the area we're focused on come in and it pushes things around you can use either of those numbers and it will come up because a lot of times you'll see it uh, cited with the old citation number in parentheses and uh, the new one here. So under the current statute is 347A and we see that it, it prior had a different number. But anyway, we're looking at the two standards under 347A1, which is the may render injurious and the ordinarily injurious to health. And the difference is added versus non-added. So when do we have, what, what do we mean by added? What do we mean by non-added? And US v. Lexington Mill followed the original Pure Food and Drug Act in 1906. This case was heard by the US Supreme Court in 1914. And it is still today the, the, the case, the seminal case to look at when we're, we're figuring out what does it mean to be added? And 
what we learned from that case on, on this lesson, on this lesson of added, is that the focus is on the food and not necessarily on the constituent. So that court said, is the food product at the end in injurious to health? And that is somewhat helpful, but not really helpful. But you have to think that it, was, it wasn't looking at these two standards that we had, because we didn't have those standards till 1938. So based on this poisonous or deleterious, we were saying, look at the whole food. Don't look at the, the ingredient that was added. We have a case that comes later, U.S. v. Commonwealth v. Brewing Corp. Yes, this is an alcohol case, but you have to remember that as these agencies change and morph and, and things are broken apart, what is food has changed. So this, this was FDA law at the time, and it does apply to the FDA. And here, in this case, from 1945, looking at the prior New Food and Drug Act of 1938, this court said that the focus is on the quantity of what is added. And so we start to see this idea that there should be a threshold, that there is an action level or a threshold level on what is being added and whether or not that quantity is in itself harmful. So we have this somewhat natural um, definition from these two cases. We have this focus on quantity, focus on the total food, but it still doesn't offer any predictability for industry to know what is going to be deemed an adulterant, when is it going to be enforced, and what does this mean. So finally, the FDA put together a, a rule, a regulation on this in 21 CFR 109.3 that put actual teeth, actual definition really, to what this was. And in some ways we could say that, you know, it was what we would guess it would be. And that is not non-added means naturally occurring. And so if it's naturally occurring, we're under the ordinarily injurious standard. And if it is not naturally occurring, then that means it's added. And so that's more or less how we can think about what standard we're going to be under. So if we add an ingredient that isn't naturally there, we're under this may render injurious. If it's naturally occurring, then we're under this ordinarily injurious standard. But the FDA went further. It said not only are we going to say naturally occurring means not added, but if you increase it to abnormal levels, and it gives them you know, examples of what that means, if you push that naturally occurring uh, ingredient element component beyond its normal levels, then it's gone from naturally occurring non-added to being an added component. And so we had this in 1975-77 was when this definition from the regulations came out. And not long, we had uh, a case that was trying to get some definition. What do you mean increased to normal levels? And, and the Anderson Seafoods was in the reading, and we see that this issue of mercury being present, and how does this mercury, which we would say is naturally occurring in the environment, is increased to normal uh, abnormal levels. We saw the court in Anderson Seafoods really break down and say is that the FDA it isn't allowed to differentiate between the quantity of mercury that was added and the current quantity of mercury that was naturally present. And so the definition was very broad <clears throat> looking at what uh, is artificially introduced, what is attributable in some degree to man. So we have this increase to normal, abnormal levels having a very broad definition. Anything that's artificially introduced, anything that's attributable in some degree to the acts of man will be considered added and therefore under the may render injurious health. So we spend a lot of time looking at added versus non-added and it's kind of like that definition that we started with in the first lecture, uh, what is food? And it's important to know what is food because without knowing what the particular food item is, we don't know what case law applies, we don't know what statute applies, we're completely lost. It's the same way here. If we don't know if we're talking about an added component, a non-added component, 
you look back at the flowchart, it has confectionery on there, it has its own set of rules. If we don't know what, where we're at in this scheme, then we don't know what standard is going to apply. And it's really important to know what standard applies. The May Render Injurious Standard makes it incredibly uh, easy for the FDA to seize foods, to find that the food product is adulterated, and to take action against the company. So we come back to the US v. Lexington Mill. It gave us a little bit of insight into what it meant to be added, but it gives us more insight into this idea about injurious to health. And what we see there is that food containing a toxicant, if there's any possibility that it can injure the health, it's an adulterant. And from the Lexington Mill case, we see that there's no need for conclusive proof, that we can look at vulnerable populations, we can speculate, well, what if the elderly ate this? What if the young ate this? What if this is being targeted or marketed towards a particular population that's prone to an illness or is, you know, like chicken soup or some sort of food that would be given to you when you're sick? What about taking that into consideration? We also see that it's very broad that we have, um, it's considered an adulterant unless it cannot by any possibility, I mean this is incredibly broad, any possibility injure the health of the consumer. So this may render injurious standard is very easy for the FDA to come in to speculate and to look at vulnerable populations and put the burden on the company or the industry that it's focused on to say how by any possibility can this ingredient not be injurious to health that's being added. And remember, this is something that we're looking at both in the context of food additives that we'll talk about, but also outside the context of food additives. Uh, and so it can include a wide scope of components that we're bringing in. And then we contrast that with the ordinarily injurious standard. We have to show a greater probability of harm. This is a natural ingredient after all. We have to show that it's injurious when consumed in the quantities and by the consumers that we would expect it to consume. So we don't get to do this speculation about vulnerable, property, uh, vulnerable populations, about the sick, the elderly, the young. We, we actually have to look at what type of consumer is going to eat this and, and are they eating it in the quantities that we have. And we saw in the readings that we get to look at this oyster case and looking at the bits of shell that were in there. And what the court there said, and in particular, it really it was, you know, the, the author mentions impressed by the proof that no one had been injured or became ill from eating the food uh, after a very long period and a, and a number of sales, that we have to ask this question, if this natural element isn't causing harm, it really is difficult to remove it 100%, then are we, in effect, having the FDA come and remove an entire food, in this case oysters, from the market? And if we're, if we're getting to that point, then we have an issue that we cannot, the act does not allow the elimination of food, but of, of these components of food. So it's very easy to defend, and it's very difficult for the FDA to come in and enforce on this ordinarily injurious standard. Typically in this area, what you're going to see is that the FDA isn't going to fight a battle on ordinarily injurious standards. It's not going to win. It's very difficult to win. What they will do is they will go to the regulations and they will look to see if there is a way to go and look at the abnormal levels standard. Is this naturally occurring component or element at abnormal levels from what you would expect? because that's going to push it from this ordinarily injurious standard to the may render injurious standard and make it easier for the FDA because they get to do everything we saw on that previous slide. They get to speculate, bring in populations, and, and have a much higher standard for the industry to meet in their burden of proof. So what we see that this leads to is section 346, tolerances for poisonous or deleterious substances in foods and what I think this is helpful for the industry is it makes this may render injurious standard more workable for the agency. And it takes this 32 years of litigation that we had from 1906 until 1938 
and it provides some some meat to what the, the courts have been saying and it provides uh, something for the agency to work within and it provides something for the industry to know when to expect litigation and to know how to uh, prepare for that and avoid that. And so these tolerance levels that we see in Section 346 really make this may render injury standard, standard more workable for industry and for the agency. And it, and it does account for all of these cases that we have been discussing. So as we can see, this is a, a complicated process. Even when we get down to narrowing the scope from just two or three of these components in this list, that even within those components, there's a lot of questions we have to ask. There's a lot of standards and there's a lot of case law that we have to look at to make these decisions. So hopefully this gives you a sense of what adulteration is. And then we can start uh, in the next component looking at economic adulteration.